All right. If you would open up your Bible to Genesis 26, I'd appreciate that as you follow along with me today. The Bereans received the word of God gladly, and they searched the scriptures daily. And so it's important that when you come to church that you understand that these are not the ideas of man, but these are the words of God that we read in the scripture, and we're accountable to God uh, for these words. And these words are life. They are able to sustain us and to bring us through some of the deepest and darkest times in our lives. I found that out re recently in battling cancer and still battling it. And so did my friend Ryan Newport, who is here. Uh, he, I think right around the same time, right? We, we, we got cancer and we were both battling at the same time. He, his, his treatment went to a greater degree than mine. I had chemotherapy. My cancer isn't gone, but he, he went through a treatment that actually wiped everything out in his body, and, and then they kind of gave him the stem cells back so that he could be free of cancer, and you are as of today, right? And so we can praise the Lord for that, and we're, we're grateful to have you here. I know him because uh, he was in our, our academy, and I remember him and Scott Brower were in the same class because they were both in that kindergarten class, and uh, they, I, I really look back with fond memories at the two of them being in our school. So welcome. Thank you for coming. You know, our lives tend to be defined by the people that are in them. Isn't that true? Uh, to one degree or another, you say, well, not me. I'm an individual, you know. <laughs> but, you know, you're really not. The fact is it's inescapable. We're going to be swayed and influenced by the people that we are around. But Christians do not need to be conformed to the inhabitants of this world. In other words, as Christians, we have been given the freedom in order to be conformed to Christ and to his image and to bear, we're image bearers of God. And so, for, I, I was talking to somebody who, who was godless, atheist, and, and, and one, of the, one of the things that I said is, yes, you are free. You're, you're free from righteousness. You don't have to, uh, to, to do that which is righteous, but you're in bondage to the depravity of the world. Okay, so everyone is in bondage, and I would rather be in bondage to Christ and to his righteousness than to the depravity of this world. I am glad that Christ has set me free. And so we can't ever get the idea that we're going to stand before God one day and say to him, well, it was because of the situation that you put me in, that's why I am the way that I am. Okay, that might serve well for clinical psychology, but that is not good Bible, all right? So in other words, we can't say, okay, nurture, nature, it's my setting, it's the people in my life, I was kind of put in that track and there was no way that I could, could be swayed from it. That's not true. That is just a lie straight from the devil. When you are saved, you are set free. And you don't have to repeat the same mistakes that your, your parents ha have made. And you don't have to be swayed by the influence of culture. Well, I think that that was a danger in the life of Isaac. Not all of the time, but I think it is something that we notice, especially in Genesis chapter 26. So I'd like us to open our Bibles and look at verses 1 through 6, first of all. It says... There was a famine in the land, besides the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went to Abimelech, the king of the Philistines, in Gerar. Then the Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land of which I shall tell you. Dwell in this land, and I will be with you and bless you. For to you and your descendants I give all these lands, and I will perform the oath which I swore to Abraham your father, and I will make your descendants multiply as the stars of heaven. I will give to your descendants all these lands, and in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. So Isaac dwelt in Gerar. Now, Isaac traveled just like Abraham traveled. You know, he is a nomad in the land that God had promised to Abraham. And he is kind of a recipient of that which God promised to Abraham. 
Now, it appears that he entertains the idea of going down to Egypt when the famine comes into the land. And we say to ourselves, well, where on earth would he get that idea? Well, his dad did the very same thing. His dad went down into Egypt when there was a famine in the land. Yet God clearly commands him not to do so. It is a very explicit command. You don't go down there. And to Isaac's credit, he obeyed God. And uh, God, after this determination for him to obey and to stay in the land, God gives him affirmation and hope. We talk about in Isaiah 14, the I wills of Satan. Well, here in this chapter, we have the I wills of God. Notice what God says in these statements in the first six verses. He is telling Isaac over and over again, I am going to be there for you. I will do what I have promised to your father Abraham. And then it's interesting, Isaac is blessed. And what is the reason why? Well, the Bible tells us, right? It says, because Abraham obeyed the Lord's voice. It doesn't say Isaac. But it says, Abraham obeyed the Lord's voice and kept his charge, commandments, statutes, and laws. And this is in keeping, I think, with Isaac, at least the presentation that we have from the scripture, with Isaac being defined by other people, and in this case, his dad. And you say, well, is that a bad thing here? And the answer to that is no. Uh, we can be defined by others in a good way, right? Uh, our fathers, our mothers can pass down a spiritual heritage that can be a great help to us. Isaac was influenced by the kindred spirit that he had with his son Esau, uh, like we saw last week. And so here he has a godly father uh, to whom he, he had a great relationship, as far as we can tell, and he obeyed his father. And we, we see that especially when we see the sacrifice take place on Mount Moriah. So the text mentions the commandments, the statutes, and the laws of God, but this is well before the Mosaic Covenant. Have you ever thought about that? What does this mean? Well, Abraham was justified by the law, right? No. Abraham was not justified by the law. What does the Bible tell us? Abraham was justified by faith. The Bible says that Abraham was justified by faith. And yet, we have the laws and the statutes being mentioned here. Well, was Abraham obedient in his walk with God? Surely he was. Because faith works. Faith does exactly what God tells us to do. We believe God. We believe God that if we head down a certain road, it's going to be bad for us. We believe God if we make the right turns and, and we follow him, and even though it's a narrow path, that that's going to be a good choice and we're going to like the result. And so we believe what God has said to us. We, re we believe what God has revealed to us, and so we obey God. Abraham obeyed God even before an explicit law was given to uh, the people, the nation, even before the nation was formed. Abraham believed God, and we need to believe God as well. You say, well, do we believe God by obeying the law? And the answer to that is no. No, we are no longer under the law. You say, well, how does it work for us? Here's how it works. When you walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. That's how it works. That's what Galatians 5 and verse 16 says. As a matter of fact, verse 18 says that today those led by the Spirit are no longer under the law. You say, well, shouldn't we be tracking down those 633 commands in the Old Testament and all the imperatives in the New Testament? Well, we should be well aware of the commands of the Bible and what God wants in us. And we should be obedient. But, but, but really, there are only two commands, according to the Lord Jesus, that need to occupy my mind. And that is to love my God supremely and to love others as I love myself. Jesus said that if you do those two things, then you will fulfill all the law. That's what he said. And either we believe that or we don't. And so that's what we should be preoccupied with. Look at verse 7. And the men of the place asked about his wife, and he said, She is my sister. Where have we heard that before? She is my sister, for he was afraid to say, She is my wife, because he thought, Lest the men of this place kill me for Rebekah, because she is beautiful to hope to behold. Abraham and Isaac evidently had very good choice in women, uh, as far as their physical appearance is concerned, and, and even their, their, uh, their inward uh, meek and quiet spirit, for the most part, uh, is concerned. And uh, 
So we, we see that they were very concerned about heathen kings and leaders taking their wives for their, for, for their own. And so he decides to lie and, and to deceive in order to hide the fact that, that, that Rebecca belongs to him. Even after watching what had happened to his father, he did this. Is that a life defined by another? I would say it is. Verse 8, it says, Now it came to pass, when he had been there a long time, that Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked through a window and saw, and there was Isaac showing endearment to Rebekah, his wife. Then Abimelech called Isaac and said, Quite obviously, she is your wife, because you don't do that with your sister, right? <laughs> so how could you say she is my sister? Isaac said to him, Because I said, lest I die on account of her. And Abimelech said, What is this you have done to us? One of the people might soon have lain with your wife, and you would have, been, you would have brought guilt on us. So Abimelech charged all his people, saying, He who touches this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. Now you remember, and, and I think Abimelech is going to have a lot to do with shaping the life of, of, of uh, Isaac as well. But do you remember uh, Abimelech is a title? just like Pharaoh is a title or president is a title. So it's not a proper name. Uh, so this may be the same Abimelech as in the day of Abraham when he had his exchange with Abimelech, but he would be very, very old. So it's not probable. It's possible because men could live as old as, about, uh, as 150 back in the days uh, of Abraham and Isaac. So we don't know for sure, but it really... It doesn't matter because the title, all right? That's what is key here. This is the title of the leader of the, Phil the Philistines. And this is the beginning of the Philistine people. So this factors into it. Gerard, the city, this Philistine territory, Isaac decides, I'm going to, I'm going to stay in this land. And uh, this is where I'm going to camp out. And... Um, he has this same personal difficulty because of what I think is probably an unwise choice. Um, you say, can we say that he was being sinful here and going into Gerar and dwelling with the Philistines? And we can't say that because the Bible doesn't say that. But we can say that it's going to cause some problems in his life. Look at verse 12. One of the big problems too, by the way, is that even faithful men, Abraham, Isaac, they, they, they sink into this bad pragmatism, right? Of the end justifying the means. So look at verse 12. Then Isaac sowed in that land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. And the man began to prosper and continued prospering until he became very prosperous, for he had possessions of flocks and possessions of herds, and a great number of servants. So the Philistines, and notice this, envied him. Now the Philistines had stopped up all the wells which his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham his father, and they had filled them with earth. And Abimelech said to Isaac, Go away from us, for you are much mightier than we. Then Isaac departed, and from there, or he departed from there, and pitched his tent in the valley of Gerar, and dwelt there. So he got out of the city into the valley. He didn't move too far away. So the Lord blesses Isaac. That's what the scripture says through the course of time. Look at the way that it's pronounced here and emphasized. The text outlines the progression of his prosperity uh, under the Lord's hand. It says here that he began to prosper, he continued prospering, and it kept going until he became very prosperous. And that's not always a good thing. So the I wills of God earlier in the chapter are coming to fruition just as he said. It's happening exactly the way that he said. And Abimelech even stated that Isaac was mightier than the Philistines. It's interesting to me that the text presents Isaac as passive once again. Receiving the blessing of God, being told by this king, even though he's mightier than this king, go away, and he goes away. Uh, you say, well, that, that could be a good thing. Um, yeah, it can be. There's, there's a good aspect to that, to the fact that he didn't get embroiled in, in a big heated 
exchange with the king and there wasn't uh, warfare and bloodshed as a result of having a hot temper and, and doing th something that he would definitely regret. All I'm trying to point out is that he reacts in life. He's not really a proactive person. Look at verse 18. And Isaac dug again the wells of water which they had dug in the days of Abraham his father. For the Philistines had stopped them up after the death of Abraham. And he called them by the names which his father had called them. Also Isaac's servants dug in the valley and found a well of running water there. Let me stop for a minute there. When the Bible talks about running water, it's talking about an artesian well. So you know what that is, right? It's a, it's a water supply that just continues to percolate up. And it just seems to be never ending. It's always flowing and it can run that way for years and years and years. And that is some of the best water that you could ever get because it's being filtered naturally. It's fresh. It's constantly moving so it doesn't stagnate. So Isaac found a well like that. And look at verse 20. But the herdsmen of Gerar quarreled with Isaac's herdsmen saying the water is ours. So he called the name of the well Isaac. Or quarrel. That's what the word Isaac means. Because they quarreled with him. And then he moves on and he digs another well. Look at verse 21. Then they dug another well and they quarreled over that one also. And so he called its name Sitna, which means enmity. And he moved from there and dug another well. And they did not quarrel over it. So he called its name Rehoboth, or spaciousness. Because he said, for now the Lord has made room for us. And we shall be fruitful in the land. Again, I see more indication of just that passive nature of Isaac in, in this text. And it, it seeps into the people that are his men, his family, the people that are even in leadership positions here. But God continues to bless him. God continues to help him overtake his enemies and even to replace what his enemies take from him. In other words, God is fighting for him. And Isaac is going to be blessed in spite of Isaac, right? And that's the true truth with you as well. God will bless you in spite of you. <laughs> Isn't that good news? Because we get in the way a lot. And so here we have Isaac's personality in the text. Uh, and, and yet we have to go to the other side and look at it from another perspective and say, well, you know, Pastor O, maybe it's a strength. Maybe we have a man before us that is obedient to God and he's willing to allow God to fight his battles. He's a meek man. He's somebody that relies upon God's strength and God's power. And that could very well be. Uh, many might have escalated this thing after being told to move again and again and again into frustration and into warfare. And he did not sin by doing that. And he just continued to allow God to fight for him. Look at verse 23. Then he went up from there to Beersheba, and the Lord appeared to him the same night and said, I am the God of your father Abraham. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bless and multiply your descendants for my servant Abraham's sake. So he built an altar there and called on the name of the Lord, and he pitched his tent there, and there Isaac's servants dug a well. So now Isaac moves to the place where his father had settled on more than one occasion. When we were going through the life of Abraham, Abraham had settled in Beersheba several times. It was a place that he liked. And so that leads to Isaac doing the very same thing. It's what his father liked. It's what I will like too, I think. And so he heads over to Beersheba. And he builds an altar just as his father did. And he calls upon the name of the Lord just as his father did. And those are good things. You say, what did he do when he called upon the name of the Lord? Well, he worshiped the Lord. He adored the Lord. He prayed to the Lord. He gave thanks to the Lord. He relied upon the Lord. That's what he did. And the altar marked that. By the way, you notice something else in this chapter, and that is water. Water is emphasized over and over again. You know, water is a very precious commodity in, in Isaac's day. It, it is something that you don't take lightly. If you don't have water, then you're not able to uh, provide for your family or for your herds. You know, that's still the truth today in the Middle East. 
Water is a very precious commodity, but so is oil. So, because of that, in the Middle East, they can do all kinds of things in order to bring in water. And they have to. Otherwise, life cannot be sustained. You need a well. You need a well in order to sustain life. But the fact that Isaac left the Philistines certainly seems to engender God's favor because God continues to provide one well after another even as he moves further and further out. And do you know God will continue to provide for us in the very same way? I think of this and I know that this is an illustration, kind of a derived thought that I have about this. It's not the main thrust of the text, but we have water in the Word of God. And when the water of God's word comes in, it sustains us. It refreshes us. And without it, there is nothing that we can do that would be of any substance or of any good for God. Thank the Lord for the water of the word. Then, verse 26, Abimelech came to him from Gerar. So now Abimelech is coming out to him with Ahuzeth, one of his friends, and Phicol, the commander of his army. That doesn't look good. And Isaac said to them, Why have you come to me, since you hate me and have sent me away from you? But they said, We have certainly seen that the Lord is with you. So we said, Let there now be an oath between us, between you and us, and let us make a covenant with you, that you will do us no harm, since we have not touched you, and since we have done nothing to you but good, and have sent you away in peace. You are now the blessed of the Lord. So he made them a feast, and they ate and drank. Then they arose early in the morning and swore an oath with one another. And Isaac sent them away, and they departed from him in peace. It came to pass the same day that Isaac's servants came and told him about a well which they had dug, and said to them, We have found water. So he called it Sheba. Now, I think there's wordplay here. In Hebrew, it's, it's a homonym for the word seven and the word oath. And so, uh, oath or seven is the definition. Therefore, the name of the city is Beersheba, or well of oath, or well of seven. And oath fits in the context here. So, that is the choice that most make. But the idea of fullness and, and perfection is found in the uh, idea of seven too. And that is exactly what God is doing for Isaac and providing for him. But still, Isaac is defined by his father's path. Uh, it's amazing to me, we don't have very many words of Isaac, do we? And, and it's just very limited, economical, even what he says in this text uh, is very limited. Oh, he, why have you come to me since you hate me and, and, and you've sent me away from you? I mean, it, it's just odd to me. And yet, he is being shaped by the people around him and that's how the scripture is presenting it. Even the oath between the Philistines is simply a renewal of what his father did in the past, isn't it? His father made the original uh, covenant with the uh, original Abimelech or the same one maybe. And this is a renewal. This is a renewal of that covenant and the relationship that this family had with the Philistines, which is going to erode as we continue on in our Bibles. His father had this, and Isaac simply did what his father would have done. That's the point that I'm trying to make. Now look at verse 34. When Esau was 40 years old, he took as wives Judith, the daughter of Beeri, the Hittite, and Basimoth, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite, and they were a grief of mind to Isaac and Rebekah. Now, when you first look at those verses, you say to yourself, what on earth does that have to do with chapter 26? And I thought that way. As a matter of fact, when I was going through this and studying, I was thinking to myself, you know what? I'm going to just use 26 and 20, or, or, I'm sorry, I'm going to use verses 34 and 35 for chapter 27. Uh, but yet, there is a connection to chapter 26, and it forms a great bridge to chapter 27. The, it, the, the passage belongs, both of these verses belong to both chapters. Just when Isaac rids himself of fear over the Abimelech, now he has internal struggle within his family. What is such a grief to him now? It's the fact that his son took Canaanite wives. 
That's the struggle. The struggle is no longer an external one, but an internal one. It's in-house. It's a family struggle. And that's what's happening here. The Lord showed his displeasure with the Canaanite people already. I mean, don't we know that by now? Because Abraham sent his servant where? Outside of the land in order to, back to where he used to live, in order to get him a wife, to get his son a wife. Don't you dare take a woman from the Canaanite people because God is going to judge this people. I don't want them to have a connection with the land. And so for for uh, Isaac to see his son, the son that he favors, do this is a great grief to him. And yet there is nothing that he can do about it. How do you feel about that as parents? Isn't that a struggle? My sons make the very same mistakes I make even though I forewarn them. And there is nothing that I can do about it. It's the most helpless position to be in. You tell them what is right, you show them how to do it, and they just have to forge their own way by using their own forehead, bashing it up against granite until they're bloodied and bruised. You say, no, there's a better way. And they say, no, I'll go my own way. That's hard, isn't it? And that's exactly the relationship that Esau has with his father. I mean, after this despising of the birthright that we talked about last week, now all of a sudden, this, this guy is just going to live his own life and make his own decisions. And he purposely marries these women in order to be a thorn to his parents. It's amazing. It's difficult to watch our children take for granted the promises of God and despise them as they often do. You say, when do our, when do our children despise the promises of God? When they pay them no heed. You know, I, I won't say who, but I was praying, and, and one of my sons, he, he had his face up, and he was, he was making faces and all kinds of things during prayer. I'm sure they've all done this at one point or another. And, and I, I stopped, and I, I have to explain to them that this is not, we, we, we are talking to God. This is not flippant. This is not light. This is something that is very sinful that you're doing. This is not befitting a child of the king, right? So our kids despise what they have been given. We ourselves despise what we have been given. We pay far more attention to this world than we ought to. And because of that, we run into these trials and we're faced with wreck and ruin in our lives. We can do nothing to help our kids because we've done nothing to help ourselves. We're not trusting in the Lord. Now, we have families. And, and I know that some of you are living for the Lord as parents. You are going to pass down a godly spiritual heritage, Lord willing. From father to son, just like from Abraham to Isaac in this passage. And at the same time, when the chapter closes with Isaac's own son despising his heritage, we are reminded of the fact that our children have to make their own choices and their own decisions. I can't respond to God for my kids any more than I can respond to God for you as a pastor. I watch it all unfold, and it grieves me, but there's nothing that I can do. But I can pray, and I can keep preaching, and I can keep telling people what is right. And so the one great characteristic of Isaac must belong to all of us. We need to remain confident in the promise of God's presence and provision for us. This is true even in the face of envy and enmity. This is what Isaac received from the Philistines. Both of those words are mentioned, envy and enmity. And yet, Isaac remained confident that God would do what he said he would do. God will be there with me, presence, and God will provide for me, provision. So, I want to end with that. God's presence and provision in the face of envy and enmity. First, we can have faith in God's presence and provision, but that faith must be, number one, personal. That faith must be personal. Number two, that faith must be proven. It must be proven. 
And then number three, that faith, it must be prosperous because God has promised that it would be so. So let's talk about the first uh, point in all of this, and that is that that faith must be personal. When the Lord appeared to Isaac at the beginning of our chapter, in verse 3 it says that he told Isaac to dwell in the land, and then he promised his presence and provision after that. If you look up the Hebrew to that word, and you can do that on your own these days, right? If you look up the Hebrew uh, for dwell, it means to sojourn or to be a stranger in a land. And so, what was God saying to Isaac? He was saying, you're going to be a stranger in the land just like your father was. In other words, not only did Abraham not receive the land, but you're not going to receive the land either. You're going to just continue to travel like a nomad around the land. And Isaac accepted that. So Abraham would realize the ownership of the land through his progeny. Isaac too. As a matter of fact, it's not going to be until several hundred years later that they enter into the land under Joshua's command. And even then, do they take the land the way that God wanted them to? No, that's what Judges is about. They failed in their conquests of the land. They did not drive out all the Canaanites. And because of that, it became a thorn in their side. And they began to worship false gods. That's the history of Israel. That's our Old Testament. All right, so um, here uh, you have this each successive generation, God promising to bless them, to be with them, to multiply them, and to make of them a great nation. That means that each successive generation had the way of escape, right? But they had to have personal faith and take it. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but will with the temptation also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. In other words, here's the way. Walk in it. Now, will our children walk in it? Well, they will decide, won't they? Can you decide for them? Maybe for a little bit, but there's coming a day when they will be adults and they will decide. And so we need to keep that in mind. Faith in God's presence and provision is personal. No one else can take you through the way of escape. You know what's so wonderful is when we do take the way of escape, the Bible promises us that God will give us incomprehensible peace. It's, it's a peace that surpasses all understanding. We can't even grasp it. That God will give us this peace, guard and protect our hearts and minds, even though things may be falling out, uh, apart around us, we have this peace. We have this inner disposition that is trusting and confident in God. Philippians 4.19 My God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. So here's the question. Do you believe that? Well, you have to determine whether or not you believe that and you're going to trust in that. Abraham's faith only provided a pattern for Isaac. And Isaac needed to have personal faith. So my question to you is, do you? Do you have personal faith? Do you believe that your God will provide all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Do you believe that? While faith in God's presence and provision is personal, second, it's proven. It is proven. Um, you know, both Abraham and Isaac were tested. That's what it means, right? Proven. They were tested and they, 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 they came out. Uh, sometimes on the good side and sometimes on the bad side. That's what makes the Bible the Bible, right? We're not just given the accomplishments and strengths of men. We're given the weaknesses and the foibles of men too. And so both Abraham and Isaac were tested when it came to honesty. Did they succeed? And the answer is no. They, they failed. They lied. They deceived. They were both tested at a time of fa famine. Did they succeed? Well, you know, they did. They they, they, one went down to Egypt, the other went to the Philistine city of Gerar. You, you might question their wisdom, but, but they trusted that God would provide for them. They didn't go to a place where God said, don't go. And so the promises of God are there, uh, but there are testings along the way. And we need to realize that. 
you say, why, do, why are we tested so often? Why, why does our faith have to be proven? I'll give you the answer. The promises of God are proven in the crucible of your trials and your afflictions. Because a faith unchallenged is no faith at all. That's just the fact of the matter. And so our, our personal faith, faith needs to be tested. The faith of my sons, the faith of your sons and daughters, they, they need to be tested. And we may face similar tests. Uh, my sons might face the, many of the same tests that I face, but, but, but they, they themselves need to be proven. You say, can you give them some advantage? I can. I can give them some advantage. I can, I can speak to them. I can speak truth to them. And, and I can show them the way, but they must take it. They must walk in it. They also may walk in a way that I used to walk. They may repeat the same mistakes that I used, used to make. And when they do that, what do they need from me? They need my prayers. They, they need me to be waiting on the front porch like the prodigal's father, right? Praying and begging God to turn them around. They need my love and they need my support. It's been my experience through the 25 years that I've been around believers that sometimes we love to eat and eat and devour our own. You say, what are you talking about? Well, I, I have seen uh, children turn on parents and parents become very bitter toward their children and alienate them. When, when our children rebel and they are no longer practicing the truth, but instead they're suppressing the truth, that is when they need our prayer. That is when they need our compassion and our love. And that is not a time for the church to isolate parents like that either, but to continue to reach out and to minister to them and to love them. I think we need to get a hold of that truth. And so it's very important that it's a personal faith, that it's a proven faith. Now, you say, what, what ruins faith most? And, and I would have to say to you, it's fear. And I'd, I'd, like to, I'd like to just give you one verse from 1 John. I think that Isaac r wrestled with fear. And I, I'd like to give you one verse from 1 John that, that will help you, I think. 1 John 4, 18, it says, There is no fear in love. Fact. There is no fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. So, do you know that there are two types of Christians? There are those that are fearful and there are those who are fearless. That's just the way that it is. Uh, 1 John 4 verse 18 begins with a statement of fact. There is no fear in love. And the Greek text, if you look at a Greek Bible, you'll see the word phobos is right at the beginning of the sentence. In the Greek text, sentence structure matters when they put a word like that right at the beginning it means they're emphasizing that word and if you don't think they're emphasizing that word just take a look at the verse how many times is the word fear repeated four times in one verse and so it, it you say what is this fear well it's not the fear of god it's not that we are supposed to fear god to revere him and to respect him it's not talking about that fear it's talking about human fear. It's the opposite of confidence, courage, and boldness. It, it is being discouraged. It's being drained of your courage. And often Christians have this fear that comes into their lives and halts the process of proven faith. They don't move forward. They fail the test. And so uh, they have this needless dread. We don't have to live under that kind of fear. Okay. There should not be needless dread in our lives. You say, but you don't understand what people are doing to me and, and all the, the confluence of the circumstances that are swirling around me. But the fact of the matter remains, all right? You've gotten your eyes off of Christ. And that's why you're afraid right now. Because you can, you can go through uh, life-challenging difficulties and trials, and you can do it fearlessly, confident, knowing that your God will go there with you. Boy, that, that is important. We're going to talk about that tonight when we look at Psalm 23 before the Lord's Supper. But some of us are fearful. We've lost sight of God's love. That's the key. That's what's missing, according to verse 18. You know, 
if there's love, then there's no fear. I, I need to regain an understanding so that God will change me and transform me so that I'll be confident again, word-centered again, and spirit-filled again. When I pray for the staff in my daily prayers, every time I pray, Lord, I pray that they will be word-fed, spirit-led believers. Because if they are, then uh, all of the problems that we have coming up with people would resolve themselves and make my job a whole lot easier as an administrator bringing teacher, student, and parent together and to live harmoniously. You say, well, why? Because then we would be living the Christian life. And yet, we get fearful. And fear involves torment. It includes pain and suffering. We actually believe that we will face the retribution of God, and so we fear. God doesn't want us to lead, lead life that way. Fear will paralyze you. It will keep you from doing what is right. As a matter of fact, if you ask, how do I honor and please God with my life? You're asking the right question. But too often, we're asking, how do I protect myself? If you're asking, how do I protect myself? You've got it wrong. You really do. You cannot protect yourself. God protects you. And he's proving that he is there with you as you go through difficulty. So it is personal, it is proven, and then last, it is prosperous. Is there any doubt that it's prosperous? You say, are you talking about materially? Well, maybe, maybe not. If God gives you a lot of material prosperity, look out, you're going to have a hard life. Because there are going to be a lot of people that want a lot from you. But that's not the only problem that you're going to face. If you have a lot of money and a lot of wealth, God demands even more from you as far as being a wise steward with what you have. You know, the poor man can squander his resources just as well as the rich man. God is not looking at how much you have. God is looking at what are you doing with what you have. That's the key. And things get really bad if you start envying people who have a lot. Right? Because then all of a sudden, you are no longer content with what God has allowed you to have. That is very dangerous. So prosperity here is, well, God. God is on my side. God is providing good things for, for me. You know, we often ask that age-old question, why, why do bad things happen to good people? But we fail to realize that there are no good people. Uh, when we look at Isaac's life, the, the question is, why do good things happen to a man like Isaac? That's the question. And we wonder that same question about ourselves. Why has God blessed me so? Why has God done so, so much great and mighty things for me? I can hardly believe that he would uh, deign to do what he has done for me. He, I have prospered in my life in spite of the fact that I have feared, in spite of the fact that I have deceived, in spite of the fact that I have sinned against God. God still prospers me. You say, why? Because I'm his child. And when you're a father, you begin to understand that. I belong to him. He's my heavenly father. Actually, Isaac obeyed God by staying in the land. So God did exactly what he said he would do for Isaac in spite of what Isaac did sinfully. You know, the, the, that material and spiritual blessing both are, are, um, are, 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 can, can really cause problems in our lives. I don't want to say that they can be a blessing and a curse because that's not communicating quite the right thing. But when you start to prosper, there's envy. Even if you're spiritually prospering. You know, people can envy even over that. I, I, I was in a situation one time where, where a person was envious over my life and what I had. And it made them very, very angry. And, and I did not know about it until it all just kind of exploded. What do you do when you're faced with that type of thing? Well, you have to realize that that's what happens with our sinful hearts. And we have to beg God to show us why. When, when we are being blessed, we tend toward apathy and, and toward indifference. Even, 
even blessed spiritually. Look at all of the books that you have written uh, about the scriptures. Look at all the different translations of the scriptures you have. Look at all the advantage that you have in listening to preaching on, on your earphones. And, and just look at all of the advantage we have. And yet, why are we so apathetic? I mean, if people were actually availing themselves of all of these resources that are out here, then we would be packing this room every Sunday and building new buildings to fit people in them. And yet, it's not happening that way. Why? We live in a land of prosperity. We're given a greater responsibility and we're not wise stewards of the responsibility that we've been given. I'm talking about as a nation. You understand? I'm not talking about you personally, although it could be you personally. To whom much is given, much shall be required. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the privilege of being able to preach the Bible each Sunday. I'm just thankful for what you teach me personally. And that I get to share the fruit of that with others is just a wonderful, wonderful blessing. Help us, Lord, to understand that our surroundings and, and the people we know and, and love tend to shape us. If, if we are free of the constraints of righteousness and in bondage to sin, we will continue to shift with the rest of the world. People will continue to define us. However, we are asking that you would conform us into the image of your Son. Let our faith in you be deeply personal proven through time, and truly prosperous. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.